Well, welcome everybody to Tech Canada's Deeper Insights webinar series. My name is Ruth Ann Marley, and it is my pleasure to be the host again. This, uh, it's 2022, it's just amazing. Um, our guest today is David Coletto. And David, uh, I've had him on the show a couple of times. And I said to him before we came live is that I, I'm always, always um, amazed at, at the amount of information and statistical data that he pulls together and puts in such a meaningful way. So for those of you who haven't uh, sort of checked David out before, he is the CEO and founding partner of Abacus Data, which is a full service market research and strategy firm based in Ottawa and in Toronto. I'm going to skip over a bit, but I want to tell you that he's earned a PhD in political science here at the University of Calgary. And he is an adjunct professor at Carleton University and is also the host and producer of In Focus with David Coletto. So I'm going to put a plug in there for people to, uh, to check that out too. It's a new podcast that explores the intersection of public opinion, politics, public policy, and consumer behavior. So I don't know about you, but today is the 27th day of 2022, and it feels like it's the 953rd day. <laughs> so I want everybody to uh, please Type in your comments, your questions. Um, let's let's make this as interactive as possible. You can put it into the Q and A or into the chat, and uh, we'll make some time throughout the presentation. But I'll stop talking and turn it over to David. Welcome, David. Well, thank you, uh, Ruth Ann, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, great to be back and, and to to be sharing some data with you. I'm going to get right into um, sort of what 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 sparked um, this talk, and and uh, I'll, I'll preface this by saying. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about the economy, but I'm not an economist, um, and and I look at uh, economic issues, social issues through the lens of of a social and market researcher, and and really recognizing that um, there there's reality, and and understanding reality is is really important. But in my world, I, I deal more with perceptions and how those perceptions then impact people's behaviors and their response and their reaction to then the reality that, that, they, that they live in. And, and understanding both those worlds, I think is really critical to making really good decisions about whether that be your business or how to connect with your customers or engage your teams and, and keep them really motivated and going forward. Um, you know, obviously this pandemic has, um, has been something that, that, that has changed so much of our lives and it feels like it continually um, goes on, and when we think it's going to get better, it it doesn't. But one of the things that you know I've come to realize, and, and in fact most Canadians realized even uh, within the first year of this pandemic, is that the pandemic accelerated many of the things we were experiencing before, and likely will require us to rethink how we work and how we run the economy. So there was already an ex expectation by most people um, that that this was going to have a big impact, and then. Uh, last year in the fall, uh, I love The Economist. It always gets me thinking uh, and, and giving sort of a broader perspective. It, its its uh, cover story was um, about the so-called shortage economy that they introduced. And, and that got me, I love the, the, the framing of, of that. Um, and, and really, they were arguing in, in this piece that um, as opposed to a glut, um, that, that the new constraint to growth will be shortages, whether that be supplies, whether that be uh, products, whether that be labor, whether that be capital. And, and obviously, we, we now live in a world where it's, it's becoming increasingly clear that the short-term disruptions created by the pandemic are likely going to become longer-term realities that we need to deal with. So what I wanted to do um, as, a, as a market researcher was to understand how Canadians, how consumers, how uh, workers are experiencing this so-called shortage economy. Um, and, and so for the two big questions I, I wanna help answer and at least get you thinking about today is first, how are they, how, are, how is the public experiencing the shortage economy? How is it affecting where, how we work, um, how we think about um, ourselves as consumers and our interaction with brands and, and retailers and, and other service providers? And how we're how it's affecting our our views and behaviors as citizens and, and the political implications uh, to this. We have a minority government in Ottawa. Uh, we have two big provincial elections coming up in Ontario and Quebec this year. Municipal elections in Ontario, um, and and at any point we could technically have another federal election if if Parliament 
uh, decides that that this government uh, no longer has the confidence of the House. Uh, so let's understand that through those lenses and then start to think about what this might mean for you uh, and your organization, whether you run a small business um, or a medium or larger even size organization in the private or public sector, nonprofit, I think there's implications across the board. And so for me, what is the shortage economy? I think it's, it's about supply chain disruptions. It's about rising prices, you know, having to do more for less. It's about burnout um, that, that individuals are feeling. I've got some data on that. And uh, as well, labor, broader labor shortages that we're seeing not just in those industries that have had labor shortages for some time. I'm thinking natural resources, uh, logistics and transportation, um, even in tourism before the pandemic, those have all been accelerated, but now we're also seeing incredibly tight uh, and competitive labor markets for almost every sector of the economy. And that's true both in Canada, um, the United States, and, and increasingly in, in Europe as well. So the implications of this for me are, we will have to learn how to do more with less, whether we are our consumers, uh, whether we are uh, business owners and leaders, uh, or whether we are governments who increasingly have spent a lot of money over the last two years, but are going to have to learn over the next number of years as we get um, that spending in control and start to reduce our public debt, how to do more with less. Uh, I think you're going to see more empowered employees, whether they know it or not. Um, I'm going to argue in, in today's presentation that uh, workers have probably, uh, there's, it's, they've probably never been as powerful as they uh, are right now and, and able to leverage um, sort of the, the shortage that exists and the rising prices and the expectations that they're going to have on, on compensation, but also the, the way the pandemic has, has, has enabled more of us to live the life that we want and work where we want and how we want, that's empowered employees. I think we also have to start thinking about what customer service means um, in a world where things are in short supply, whether that be the actual products that people want, whether that be uh, the services that a smaller workforce might need to deliver and the role that technology might play in, in improving that experience, but also um, in complicating it as well. And then lastly, as I said, I think there's, there's a, a new, uh, what I call inflationary politics. And I, am, I just turned 40 in December and I've lived actually through periods like this, but I have never really experienced a time where you, you know, we have still very low inflation uh, interest rates, but the, but the prospect of a, a rapid increase in, in interest rates over the next number of years, the fact that, you know, housing prices are, are, are continuing to go up and up, and this notion that, that inflation, we might be entering an inflationary period, is, is relatively new. Now, in doing research for this presentation, I came across a, a really interesting TV ad from 1975, and I'm going to play it for you because I also think that as the times change, as circumstances change, there are new opportunities for innovation. And, and one of those innovations during the last period of intense inflation uh, was Hamburger Helper. And this was an ad that they put together. Test your shopping skills. We're preparing a main dish of one pound of hamburger, golden macaroni, sizzling cheddar cheese sauce, and special seasonings. It tastes as delicious as it looks. Now, what do you mm. think this costs per serving? Dollar twenty-five, seventy-five cents, fifty-seven cents, thirty-five cents. The answer is with Hamburger Helper, less than thirty-five cents a serving, including the cost of the hamburger. Hamburger Helper: Nine delicious ways to fight inflation. Like, think of that. Nine. That's their tagline in nineteen seventy-five. Nine delicious ways to fight inflation. Right. We haven't seen that quite yet, but expect to see if this continues and these inflationary times uh, continue beyond what some initially thought was more transitory, it might become more uh, systemic. Um, you know, Hamburger Helper was introduced to help you spread the use of beef because the price of beef in the 70s went up as well. Um, and, and it became a household uh, product and, and household name um, and, and did uh, quite well for, for the company that, that created it. But I think it's just a really interesting way to see how um, uh, consumer um, food companies were, were really responding to, uh, to that market. Um, so let me dive into um, different aspects of the shortage uh, economy. And the first is uh, the shortage of, of human resources. Um, you know, there's, there's been lots of talk about the great resignation and, and how the pandemic has kind of accelerated that move. Uh, this is from an economist at the University of Waterloo, 
um, Michael uh, Scudderud, who's been tracking uh, what, what he calls and others economists call labor market tightness. So this is uh, the ratio of the number of job vacancies per job seeker in both Canada and the United States. And, and I think the, the picture of this is in the, the gap between Canada and the United States that's existed for, for quite some time, uh, that the labor market in the United States has been more um, tight. There's been, particularly since uh, 2018, uh, you know, once you pass the, the one ratio, you've got more job vacancies than you do people seeking work. So you are uh, at or above full employment in, in that economy. Um, and then you saw this huge drop uh, as a result of the pandemic. But the United States is more or less uh, back up and, and trending upwards into an even tighter labor market. Now, the Canadian story is different. And this is where there is some debate about whether we are seeing a, a so-called great resignation in Canada. The, the, the data we have available doesn't necessarily say it's happening, but our data isn't quite the same. Uh, certainly, you see a, a really concerning trend that the labor market is tightening. It's tightened quite rapidly. We'll see whether this trend continues or does it turn the other way, but certainly the gap's still there. We aren't the United States. Uh, there are differences here in Canada, but it, it, it's important. Now, the other data point that I, that I tried to understand in StatsCan in their monthly uh, labor uh, market survey measures uh, a group called job leavers, those who in the past year have voluntarily left their, their place of work and are still unemployed. And you can see that um, as of the last few months over the fall and into the end of 2021, um, there's a million Canadians out there who had left their job in the last 12 months and aren't, weren't currently working. Um, so that's a lot of people, but it's significantly lower than it was uh, before the pandemic and throughout most of this pandemic. We saw these seasonal kind of uh, pickups that happen after um, throughout the summer and then into the, the end of the, the summer. But, but again, another data point that suggests perhaps the great resignation isn't happening. Now, in the survey that I did, I did a national survey of, of 2,200 Canadian adults in, in January of this year, so just earlier this month. And I asked a whole bunch of questions that, that I'll share with you from this, from, from this data source. But one of them was, among employed Canadians, um, had you changed jobs in the past 12 months? And I, and I unfortunately don't have uh, longitudinal data to track this, because this was something that only uh, became of interest to me more recently, but I'll probably continue to start to track. Uh, but one out of, I was one out of five employed Canadians said they changed their job in the last 12 months. That alone to me is, um, is not, I don't think it's surprising, but to see that, to recognize that that many people within a year's time have changed their jobs um, is, is really interesting. And, and more interesting is that 9% of employed Canadians uh, um, had quit a job even when they didn't have one lined up, right? So almost one out of 10. And you can see much higher incidence of that happening um, among those age 60, uh, under, sorry, 45, particularly under 30. And that to me is an indicator of this so-called great resignation phenomenon, right? That people are getting fed up with their jobs. They're not finding it fulfilling. And so they're just walking away. They're, they're, they're dropping their tools, um, leave, putting down their laptops if they're working remotely from home and saying, I'm, I'm doing something else. And so among those that, that either quit or changed their jobs in the past year, I asked them why. Like what, what, what helps explain why you quit or change that job? And I offered a number of explanations. You, you were offered more money. You didn't like your teammates. You needed to change the job. It wasn't interesting to you. You didn't feel safe in the context of COVID, especially, or you wanted more flexibility. And what we see is that while you know, money was a, a, an issue, particularly for younger consumer, uh, workers under the age of 45, it wasn't for most the primary driver or a driver for why they changed jobs. In fact, the work wasn't interesting. I needed a change was for 71% of those under 45, a reason, um, and, and more than half of those over 45, as was I wanted more flexibility. And so when I look at this data, as opposed to the other data points we have, it suggests to me that while we may not be in a so-called great resignation yet, it might be coming. And then you add in the fact that when we, and we're gonna have way more data on this um, likely next week from Abacus, where we're gonna look at burnout as a, as a, as a, as a, as a country. But in, in the survey I did in early January, uh, about a third of Canadians described themselves at that time as feeling burned out, including you can see a big gap between those who are under 45 and those over 45, right? 
44% of under 45 year old Canadians in our survey felt whether they were or not is almost not as important as whether you feel you are felt burnt out. And, and so when you think about the labor market, I think we also have to recognize that this may be a short term phenomenon, but even if the pandemic hopefully soon, you know, becomes something in the rear view meal, the long term implications of feeling tired of knowing what burnout actually feels like, and then choosing to uh, decide and you know, there's a lot of tech uh, members on this group. I just was had my tech group right before uh, this this call. A lot of them are, are watching, so so hi everybody. Is we had as a group the, the conversation about what we wanted to do in 2022, and you heard repeatedly a desire to find balance, a, a desire not to fall into this trap of being tired. And so, what does that mean? Well, it, it could affect productivity. I think many of us were incredibly productive over the last two years put our heads down. It was a way to be distracted by what was going on. And we just got, got on with our job. But the result was we, we, we and I'm included, hit a wall uh, uh, at some point and had to realize that it wasn't healthy. And there are other indicators of this. In the survey we did, we asked, do you agree or disagree that there are days when I feel tired before I arrive at work? 77% of those under the age of 45, 61% over 45 agreed with that statement. Um, it happens more and more often that I talk about my work in a negative way. 54% of younger workers agree, 35% of those who are over the age of 45. Again, large numbers of people who not every single day or every single moment are feeling negative about their work. And let's be honest, this is not a new phenomenon. I think there's lots of people who for a long time don't love their job and, and, and see it as a grind. But I do think something new is happening where more and more people are feeling uh, not engaged at work, um, disconnected, and, and tired. And so when we think about the shortage in the labor market, it's not just about people, but also about shortages in our attention span, in our um, moods that are going to also affect our work and perhaps our, our overall productivity. So workers are tired. They're anxious, but they're also in high demand. And so I believe this, this formula, this mix has created a, a very powerful uh, force in which they've probably never been as powerful and as unpredictable um, as they are today. Or maybe they are predictable, that, that we know that they're that, that perhaps are going to leave or they're going to look for something else. But we, we need to not sit on our laurels and say, well, look, we're not having the, the great resignation events that the US is having. I see indicators that perhaps um, the conditions are there. And so you need to be mindful about your team and understand them and, and connect with them and, 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 and be compassionate is going to be one of my, my takeaways. So that's the labor market. Now, I don't have to talk uh, too much about supply chain disruptions and what's causing them um, and, and more focus on what has uh, the Canadian consumer experienced. Um, I live in Ottawa where I'm bracing for the, the trucker convoy and I don't want to talk about it, but that's not helping the supply chain challenges. Um, and they argue, particularly those that aren't making this really a political event, that the mandates and vaccines is, is part of the problem. But, but the overall issue is, is much broader than that. And just to give you a scale of the scope, again, we know it's happening, but how much? Well, almost half of Canadians say they couldn't get a product they wanted in the past 12 months because of a shortage. Not because it wasn't you know, normally available, but because they were told it's normally available, but we can't get it, right? And 84% of that group say it's happening far more often than usual, right? So this suggests it is an anomaly. There's something going on. Again, not surprising, this is obvious data, but I wanted to show the, the scale of that problem. And to give you a sense of what happens when a consumer is faced with this, I asked in the last time that this happened, when you couldn't get a product you wanted, and I honestly think this applies to services as well, which I'll show you in a minute um, is, is also part of this problem. What did you do? Did you go and buy a different brand of the same type or category of product? Did you put an order in and just wait to get it? Um, or did you just not buy the product or similar product at all? And you can see there's no one path that most people took, but that each path represents either an opportunity for a business that wants to in, you know, bring in a new customer, uh, or or or, or uh, uh, client or uh, a threat, right? And the threat, the ultimate threat, is they completely 
move on and buy something else that they wanted to buy a bike. They couldn't find a bike. And so they bought skis, right? And they went and did something completely different or, or um, you know, uh, they, they, they got into running because they couldn't find that bike. So this is reoriented consumers to not be used to living in a world where they couldn't get what they want um, if they could afford it. And, and it made sense for them financially. And so I think it's important for us to all think about how does that customer journey now look in a world where it's not as linear and obvious as perhaps it was before. Now, to give you an extent of, of the numbers, uh, I asked people um, for these different product and service categories, whether they either had to wait longer than usual to get it or whether they could not get it at all. And these numbers are the, my, my estimation of the number of Canadian adults who experienced this. So in the case of furniture, the way to read this is that there were 4.7 million Canadians who said they had waited longer to buy furniture in the past year than they normally would. And one and a half, one, almost one and a half million, 1.4 million couldn't get the, the, the piece that they wanted entirely, right? And if you go down that list, major home appliances, uh, I've got friends in my tech group, I think Ed, you're on this call, you know, landscaping, 4.2 million Canadians had to wait longer to get the landscaping they wanted done to their home. And we also know they had more money and more in impetus to do home renos or landscaping. And yet, you know, uh, there, weren't, there wasn't enough supply, right? 1.4 million couldn't get it at all. They couldn't get what they wanted done to their home, whether it inside or outside. And you go down that list, meat products, lumber, a new car, I'm a bike fanatic, even a new bicycle. There's a global bike shortage. 1.4 million Canadians said they did not, could not buy the bike that they wanted as a result of, of shortages that are going on. So that is a lot of, uh, of potential sales that aren't happening. It's a lot of churn in a market that people are perhaps disappointed, um, that has a perhaps an effect on the reputation of the supplier, of the retailer, um, you know, um, that, that, that is hard to control. And so it requires us to rethink again how we engage that customer. Now add to a supply shortage with what we know is rising prices. And you know, the, the CPI uh, numbers coming from Stats Canada or other studies are, 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 are clear as, 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 uh, as, as day, right? That, that we are at a point now where inflation has gone up faster than in any point in the last three decades. Um, and yesterday, the Bank of Canada announced, yeah, no interest rate increases this month, but it's very likely that in March, we're going to start to see increases in interest. So not only will products and services be at shorter supply, but it's going to increasingly get more expensive to hold the debt or, or, or get new capital going forward. But from a consumer perspective, again, obvious stuff. I'm not, I'm not sort of breaking any molds here, but when you ask people in your experience over the past year, do you feel the prices for each of the following types of, of, of services or products has increased, decreased, or stayed about the same? And, and we, I've only reported those who said increased a lot or increased a little because in almost every category, a majority thought the prices went up. But look at what's at the top, gas, housing, meat, produce, milk, um, and other consumer products. You've got um, large numbers who say these prices are going up. And then for those that it's most applicable, think even like financial services, like bank fees, uh, insurance, uh, professional services like lawyers, accountants, those of us who use those uh, large numbers are feeling that that inflationary pressure is, is extending beyond the obvious uh, products and goods in, in our home. So across the board, consumers feel that prices are going up. Whether they are as much as they think they are is not important because that it's, it's the perception that's going to affect ultimately their behavior. But at the same time that people are feeling these price increases, when we asked them over the past year, have the following, and we, we, we talked things like income, uh, value of your investments, value of your home, have they increased or decreased? When it comes to household income, perceptually, only one out of four think that their incomes have gone up. In fact, about the same number feel that their incomes have gone down and half think nothing's changed. So we are all feeling our prices are going up that we're paying every single day. And for particularly those households that are uh, already vulnerable to, to price increases and um, are precarious in their terms of their work, they're seeing no um, change in their wages either. Uh, even though there has been some increase in wages, it, it isn't being felt or um, appreciated uh, to the same extent. So that gap is where the politics comes in. And I'll 
And I'll talk about that uh, in a moment. But the question that I'm left with as both a service provider, as a, as a consultant who, who serves my clients and thinks about how do I make sure that they continue to be delighted and are happy with my own personal experience as a consumer in this world, left me wondering, well, has there been an impact on customer service? And so there's, there's no easy way to do this in a, in a broad sense, but I asked people in the survey, compared to a few years ago, you know, has the overall customer or patient experience, because I, I, I also looked at sort of medical um, health professional, um, in, and I didn't include it on this slide, have you received from the following types of organizations improved, worsened, or stayed about the same? And, and what you see here is that the good news, I guess, is that right now, most consumers say on all of these different uh, types of organizations, whether we're talking airlines, public sector, uh, departments, restaurants, retail, um, professional service firms, most say that the experience has not really changed one way or the other. For some, like uh, online or e-commerce e retail, look at that, right? You got 42% said, my experience has gotten better over the last few years because more of us are, are, are shopping online, we're using e-commerce platforms, and they've learned a lot from all that uh, experience and they're improving that experience, right? They want to keep us sticky. And so if there's any winner coming out of this, it's, it's certainly e-commerce, not just from a revenue side, but also from an experiential side from the customer. But look what's at the top of the list. Like not surprising airlines are, are getting a bad deal. Why? Because they're forced to change their, the way that we fly and forced to wear a mask and go through a whole bunch of, of hurdles to get there. Uh, federal and provincial government departments um, who have, whose workforce is entirely virtual aren't getting very good, good marks and even restaurants, right? Um, and the reason I show this is, is not that there's a big problem here, you know, um, uh, shining out, out of this slide. It's that despite some of these shortages, despite the fact that maybe I have to wait longer uh, to get um, to hear back from a, an insurance broker or um, the restaurant that I want to go to um, doesn't have full staff. And so they can't um, fill the restaurant, not just because there's maybe restrictions, but because they just don't have servers or, or kitchen staff to be able to, to, to go full capacity is that it's something for us to watch and to be mindful of that, you know, as we leave the um, uh, time, period of time where people are able to justify bad experiences because of the pandemic and consumers are willing and customers are willing to say, I understand, they're accepting of it, to a world where that no longer is the case means that that changing, um, thinking about how we serve our clients and customers probably needs to th change as well. And that's gonna affect it going forward. Now, the last area that I, I was really interested in, you, for those of you who've, who've seen me present before, you know, uh, I do a lot of work in the public affairs space, work with many associations and, and, and companies and nonprofits, helping them kind of think about advocacy and using public opinion uh, research to guide strategy. Is, is how is this playing when it comes to public policy, right? Um, no doubt the pandemic is still the number one priority for governments, both federally and provincially, uh, especially this, this fourth wave has been very much anxiety inducing. We've been tracking public opinion and it's, it's, it's been like a roller coaster. One month, people are feeling great. And then uh, the next month, you know, you're hitting close to peaks uh, of, of people saying that they're getting more worried about this pandemic, not less. And still, even to this day, almost half of Canadians are not sure whether the worst or uh, of this pandemic is either ahead of us or behind us, right? That just shows the level of uncertainty out there that the people aren't, can't say for certain whether the worst is now behind us or, or whether it could still come before. But on top of all of that um, focus on the pandemic, these underlying economic and, and, and social uh, impacts of the pandemic continue to froth and continue to create challenges, I think, for government. And the real problem for government is when we ask people um, following some questions around inflation, you know, you know, prices have increased um, and there continues to be shortage in both products and labor. Do you think the government, federal, provincial, can do something that will help with the, those with the following? And when it comes to inflation, when it comes to labor shortages, clear majorities say, yes, I think governments can help solve this problem. They may not be able to solve it entirely, but I think they can do things to improve it. 
Um, even half say that about supply chain disruptions and even almost half say that about product shortages, right? So people have a very, despite a lot of people being very skeptical about whether government does things effectively or not, they do believe governments can do something, right? So it's not enough for policymakers right now to go out there and say, look, there's nothing we can do. Inflation is happening. Labor shortages are happening. It's a global thing. You know, I'm going to wash my hands of this and move on. They have to be engaged and, and be empathetic and understanding that people expect that they're going to at least try to do what they can. And when we ask them about how well has the federal government in this case performed on the same things, you can see that particularly on inflation, 60% um, think they've done a poor job. And the thing that's always um, challenging for me is whether people think of the Bank of Canada and the monetary policy that it has jurisdiction over um, is is the same as the federal government. It probably is, so it's not perfect. They might this might be more of a a, a complicated evaluation because the federal the, the federal government does fiscal policy, the bank does uh, monetary, and so do, does the public. Are they able to really distinguish? But nonetheless, it doesn't matter if you're Justin Trudeau and the Liberal government. Because even if they think it's the bank's fault, they're going to blame you, and they're going to, you know, uh, uh, vote you against you if if they get that chance. So inflation, labor shortages, um, you've got majority saying they're doing a poor job, but on some of the others, you know, no one's saying. Very few people are saying you're doing a great job on this. But I always look at that that yellow bar as being really instinctive of are you doing an acceptable job? Are you doing as good as as we can be expected? And on the product shortages and supply chain disruptions. Um, there's, there's quite a number of people who, who do give the government at least some credit if they're doing anything at all, and that's up for debate, that they're at least trying to do something. But the big debate in Ottawa, if you are watching politics at all, before this uh, trucker convoy was really whether, uh, and the Conservatives want this to be, about that the federal government's decisions have had a big impact, right? And this, this debate about whether it's a global phenomenon that we're seeing or whether it's something that's being... Um, impacted by decisions the federal government are making. And so when we ask people which, when it comes to inflation and the cost of living, which of the following best describes your view, the, the federal government's uh, decisions have had a big impact on inflation in Canada, or that inflation is being caused primarily by global factors outside the control of the federal government. And on this number, you can see that far more people uh, lean towards that, no, the government's had a big impact. Um, in fact, when we look at it politically, among those who voted liberal, conservative, NDP, bloc, um, yes, conservatives much more likely to say that the federal government's had a big uh, impact on their decision. In fact, that's been they've been sort of the, leading the charge on 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 saying this and 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 sort of going after the government uh, consistently. Uh, but even a four out of ten of those who voted for the liberals in the last year's federal election think that the federal government's had big uh, big impacts on inflation. So how? What direction has that impact been? Do you think that the, they've made uh, things better? Do you think that they made things worse? Or are you, again, convinced that they've had no impact? And again, you see not a perfect story here, but almost five times more people say that the government's decisions have made things worse as opposed to better. And when you think of the political implication, 41% of Canadians believe the federal government has had a big impact on inflation and made it worse which is, um, you know, you could say, well, those are all conservatives or those are non-liberals, but in fact, um, almost one out of five of this group voted liberal in 2021, 7% of the electorate. So this is, this is when I talk about the politics of inflation. If this government continues to be hammered um, and the conservatives are successful at framing the experience we're having as consumers and as workers uh, and as business owners as being caused by something they're doing, then it becomes increasingly difficult, I think, for the Liberals to respond. They have to respond and put something in the window. Now, the last point about the politics of inflation I think is interesting is that when we ask people, which of the following would be worse for you personally? To continue to see an increase in the prices of goods or services, uh, to see increased interest rates over the next few years, or are you not sure? And you can see where the bulk of people land, that right now people are saying, the last thing I want, the thing that I think is going to hurt me the most is to continue to see this increase in prices. But in reality, I think economists would tell you the real threat is if interest rates having to continue to go up and the level of debt that many Canadian households carry is that the cost in 
increased mortgage payments, increased credit uh, card payments, increased car loan payments will easily outstrip the cost of, of you know, uh, uh, some household goods and food going up. Um, and so the expectation the public has is, I don't care if interest rates go up, if it helps slow the increase in prices, but they may not be actually fully aware of, of its impact. So this is where the gap between my perception and my reality, when they aren't aligned they, and they hit, uh, you, you get pretty severe reactions from, from people and, and they wonder why. So to wrap up, I wanna, I, I promised uh, I, I'd share some new data on what this all means. And uh, we had a federal election uh, last September in which more or less nothing changed and the House of Commons, uh, the Liberals, I think, picked up three seats, the Conservatives lost two seats, the NDP picked up one, and um, we spent a whole bunch of money and a lot of time and, and Canadians basically, you know, the verdict was exactly the same. We want a minority government. Um, and in reality, the overall perspective now is that hasn't really changed. Um, despite some of the politics going on, I'm not certain that many Canadians are paying a lot of attention to politics, but nothing that's happened over the last five months has really changed anything. When we ask people if how they would vote in an election, uh, we basically get more or less the same result. You got the Liberals at 31, the Conservatives at 31, the NDP at 19, the Bloc at eight, the People's Party at six and the Greens at four. Except for a slight decrease in the conservative vote, all of this is within the margin of error of what the last election was. And so pretty, uh, pretty much status quo. Um, the regional picture is always interesting. Um, what you see out in BC is a, a clear three-way race. The prairies are solidly in the blue camp. Ontario, slight advantage for the liberals, but not big enough that they're comfortable. In Quebec, we're starting to see the conservatives pick up a little bit, but you know, it's still a block versus liberal fight. And then in Atlantic Canada, smaller samples in this survey, um, you know, the liberals can't take the, that region for granted either. They lost uh, three seats in Atlantic Canada in the last election. And so very much a similar picture um, on the regional basis. Underneath this vote, despite the churn and the uncertainty and the pandemic still raging, not a lot of change even in approval ratings. This, this is all signals that the, the public's fairly locked in and perhaps we're starting to see more polarization where we're, there's no reason for somebody who, who, may, who may like or voted liberal uh, to, to, to switch um, and, and same thing on the conservative or new Democrat side. Approval rating largely unchanged from October um, uh, of 2021, about equal numbers approve uh, or disapprove of, of the federal government. When it comes to the leaders, um, you know, Justin Trudeau um, is not loved by Canadians, but he's not, I wouldn't say, despised by a whole lot of Canadians. Either. There's lots of people who don't like him and really don't like him, but, um, you know, he's not at a, a place where he's really, really threatened in terms of uh, his, his own popularity. On the other hand, uh, Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole is a, has the same number of people who don't like him, uh, but almost half as many who, who do. And so he's in a much more precarious position, not just with the public, but also with his own party and, and lots of questions about whether he will make it to the next election as the conservative leader. Um, and then there's Mr. Singh, the NDP leader, who is by far the most popular leader still in the country, um, and yet has a hard time converting that goodwill into actual votes, which remains his problem. For the prime minister, the trend line is pretty solid and and um, and 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 uh, not very you know people's opinions are pretty locked in on him. Uh, you've seen a little bit of, of decline in the last uh, few weeks on on Mr. Trudeau. I think we'll see whether that's a trend. Um, I do think they're vulnerable on 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 the cost of living, on inflation. I don't think uh, he's empathetic enough. I don't think he talks about it enough. I don't think people feel he gets what their lives are like, and that's a big liability. Uh, for, for, the, for the Trudeau Liberals. Um, however, when you're up against someone who has a chart like this, Mr. O'Toole, who, who did improve his green line, the positives over the election, but has seen since that election, all that goodwill that he built up, particularly among even conservatives, uh, disappear, um, you don't feel as threatened, I guess, if you're, if you're the prime minister. Um, but, but clearly, um, the political landscape um, 
remains somewhat in flux. And if an election were held today, I think we'd likely get the very same kind of politics, but it really signals uh, a growing divide in our country. I think, you know, as much as and I'm not going to get into whether the convoy, I, I'm worried about, I'm in Ottawa again, I'm worried about what they're going to do to the to, to the city. Um, but I think it's a, it's an indicator of the deep divides that are that are happening in the country. And you know, those that have been vaccinated and are getting um, impatient with, the, with how long this pandemic is going on are, are up against a, a highly emotional, highly engaged group who now have seen their position on vaccines and restrictions and, and all the other things as part of their identity. It, it, is, it is starting to tear a little bit. And our politicians, I don't think, are, are helping to smooth it out all that much. And, and so we'll see where we're headed. Uh, but certainly, I don't see... Um, a scenario in which one party is able to really rally enough people around them to win a majority government. So to wrap up, and then I'm happy to take any questions uh, folks have uh, as, as, as we sort of talk through this, or even if you've got um, ideas to share. I think what all of this suggests first is that um, the pandemic is still in focus. And so I'm trying to get us to think about a world beyond it, because until the day-to-day -day of this pandemic is, is, is over, we're still going to be anxious and we're still going to be trying to get through it and figure out what it all means. And, and if your business has been disrupted severely by it, it it's like the stop and start, stop and start that I'm, I'm certain is, is, is exhausting. But we are seeing, I think, if these, these, these forces persist, which I think they're fair to say they will, like inflation's not going to disappear as an issue uh, the moment the pandemic's over. The labor shortage is not going to disappear. Um, the demographics tell us we're an aging population. Um, more, probably more people are going to retire than they normally would have because of this pandemic. The stock market drop, correction, whatever it has been, has probably maybe put a, a little bit of damper on that. But on the other hand, housing prices are holding. And so a lot of people in Canada are much wealthier uh, at the end of this pandemic than, than when it started. And so um, that is all going to persist. But I think in an, in an inflationary period, right, I come back to that hamburger helper ad where you actually had, um, you know, our, our, our lexicon, our conversation, our selling of macaroni and, ma and, 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 and uh, beef was framed around inflation. Using that word, um, I think, is where we, we are and we're headed. And so the public's going to be very sensitive to, to, to how you as a if you're, if you're a consumer-facing organization um, selling directly to consumers, how you respond, how you increase prices, how you explain that, um, and from a public policy perspective, uh, how governments are responding. And, and ultimately, I think the public, whether they're your customer, whether they're your team member or work, workforce, or the public as, as citizens, frankly, all the time, but particularly now, are looking for empathy and a response. What are you going to do uh, to make things better? And so for me, and again, I, I'm a market researcher first, and then I try to say, well, what, are, what, what do we do about this? Um, I've got three things that I think matter. Um, first is, and Nil, who's in my tech group, is on this call. You should reach out to her. She's a big proponent of compassionate leadership. I am too. I think we need to be compassionate. Um, during these periods. We have to understand where our customers are coming from. We have to understand where our team members are coming from and we've got to engage them and keep them engaged because um, for all the reasons I showed you, whether it's because you can't service them, you can't deliver, um, how many um, you know, contractors and landscapers and others who are inundated with requests are letting people down every single day because they can't give them what they want. That's going to have a lasting legacy, right? Now business is great, things are booming, but at some point people are going to remember that you weren't there for them when you needed them, or you didn't have the product that they wanted. And I think, you know, the longer that goes on, the less um, saying pandemic, pandemic, pandemic is going to work as an excuse. And that's true in the workplace as well. Um, we're all stressed, we're all tired, we're all trying to get through it, and. In an emergency, people are willing to put up with that as an excuse. It's not going to be the case uh, a few months from now. Secondly, I'm a huge proponent of thinking about any business and any customer relationship through a hospitality mindset. And I think more than ever, 
what does hospitality mean? It means basically removing all barriers and all friction from a relationship um, that it feels like I'm at home. Um, and, and it's used often in hospitality, uh, sorry, in, in restaurants or, or accommodations, hence, hence hospitality. But I think it applies whether you are an accounting firm or you run a, a landscaping company or you sell widgets to, you know, you manufacture things that you then sell to, to others is how do you reduce the friction? Because people are anxious and they, they're looking for, for frictionless experiences. So uh, the more that you can apply that, I think the more successful you're going to be. And then the last thing is we're, uh, we've been in a, in a world where, as I said, empathy and response are, are critical. And I, and I continue to believe that um, that will serve leaders well, is to, to, to really understand um, how people are feeling to take the time, obviously, to empathize with ourselves. I think as leaders, we need to do that, but we need to also um, give people a break and, and give people a, a chance to, to catch their breath and recognize that if you've got a, a workforce that's primarily made up of those under the age of 45, as my data suggests, there's a good chance, you know, a significant number of them are, are burned out. And yesterday was Let's Talk uh, about mental health day from, from Bell. I think having conversations about it, um, is really helpful and it will also show, um, your team that you're empathetic and, and open to those kind of conversations. So I will wrap there. Um, it's a lot of data and it's, it's evolving and I don't have the full story, but this is a fascinating, we're entering a fascinating period of time that, that is going to have new opportunities for organizations, certainly. But, but also a new set of threats that many of us may not have ever had to deal with because we haven't operated a business uh, at a time when, when inflation and, and shortages are, are what the key drivers are to business success. And growth will be hampered by our inability to deliver and perhaps increasingly the inability of our customer to buy um, what we can produce um, at, at a certain cost. So, uh, Ruth Ann, I will I will stop there, and I'm happy to to take any questions that that come out. We we have a few questions and some comments that have come in uh, both here in the webinar, but also through our LinkedIn um, uh, profiles. So I think one of the first ones you've you, you know you said you weren't an economist, but but a lot of these things again perception and economy are 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 clashing here. Um, when we look at economies, and, and this is uh, John's question here. U.S. manufacturers and suppliers have made it know that they're going to serve their local markets first, and we're mm -hmm. we're hearing a lot of this closing the borders, and we need to service our you know service that, and that trickle down effect, that whole globalization that we had before, is now coming back into in compartments. What would you say to um, individuals? Again, we want we need to change perception. You know, we heard. This happened with beef before and, and other things. How do we change the perception that we don't want to just serve ourselves, that we are all together in this? It's really, really hard. I mean, look at what's going on with the U.S. Um, you mentioned the U.S. and, and, and some things, but like on, on electric vehicles, right? And, and then the very much nationalist kind of uh, policy where they say, we're going to give you a, a really uh, generous rebate on that EV if, if it's made in the United States. And, and we're challenging that given the opportunity we have in, in that space here in Canada. I, I think that, I mean, I'm not sure we can change the, the public's perception on that. And, and the reason is because um, you have to remember this pandemic reminded us how small the world really is and that what happens in other places can, ha can, can quickly affect us here. And so, and that, for many, the lesson is we weren't prepared because here in Canada, we didn't have, you know, domestic production capabilities for vaccines and we couldn't help ourselves. We, we really were reliant on others. That, 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 that's a, there's an under, that, that creates a little bit of uncertainty. But then we also have to remember that even if we get through this pandemic, the conflict between the East and the West, China versus, you know, uh, Europe in the United States and Canada is not going away anytime soon. Russia is on the verge of maybe, you know, invading Ukraine, um, that we're entering also a geopolitical world that is going to make trade, seamless trade much harder, um, I think, it feels like to me. And so on the one hand, people will 
that might uh, affect people's perceptions and expectations. They know maybe it's not going to be possible to get certain products as cheaply as maybe we had or as quickly as we had, but I'm not sure it's going to make them because I don't think Canadians are the problem, frankly. I think Canadians, in all the research I've ever done, look at the world and say, let's trade with the world, right? But I don't think we have any influence over what you know, the US or, or China actually ends up deciding. And so we, we as Canadian business owners and, and, and leaders, unfortunately, are, are, are going to be handcuffed by, by that and have to respond ourselves to, to, to make it work. And, and what I'm thinking, too, is that... <clears throat> You know, you, on one hand, you say handcuffed, but it's also a great opportunity because, you know, people were typing in about, oh, yeah, they remembered Hamburger Helper. And that product is still in existence and still selling. And then uh, I typed in about ramen. You know, when the Japanese economy went into significant recession and, 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 you know, vast inflation, ramen became, and now that's a staple. So we've got an opportunity for innovation for uh, companies again. And, you know, you were talking about that compassionate leadership to voice that out and start some innovation and start, you know, putting their, their voice and compassion into uh, some troubling times. And I also think just to add to your point, you know, someone who looks and watches what government's doing, like they're going to have a lot of incentive and they're going to probably provide a lot of incentives for for Canadian businesses that want to maybe start getting into fields that we wouldn't have thought of before because it wasn't something that made economic sense. But now, given the world we're in, you know, if you want to get into the, you know, vaccine manufacturing business, there may be. Um, you know, a subsidy there that helps you do that, that wouldn't have been there otherwise. So you're right, like, there's threats. Um, but but it's, it's, it's more about its change. And yes. so we just need to react to that change. And, and there's lots of opportunities as well. So Christopher's got a question here. He says, I'm interested in the discussion regarding the perception of the consumer influencing their behavior more than actual reality. So this goes mm. back to, you know, the uh, uh, the crab pot, you know, why, why does the, why does the, uh, the consumer think, oh yeah, I just want to know what's in my pocket. I don't care about the inflation, but it's there that the crab in the, in the, in the crock pot that's getting turned up slowly, but they're not aware right. of it. So well, it's, yeah, it's that, I think you're, it's like that frog in the water, right? You, yeah. you, you, if you throw the frog into boiling water, it jumps out right away. But if you let it there and you turn up the heat, it'll, you know, it won't move and it'll die. It'll, it'll, uh, it'll, it'll sort of boil itself. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. I, I think, you know, frankly, you know, most consumers, most people are not um, as well informed as, as, as sort of the, the top 20% who read everything and, and, and know what's going on. And so they're responding to also a whole bunch of, you know, misinformation that's out there. We have to remember, like, we're also operating in a world where if I choose to like be in a tunnel and only get uh, information from a certain source, then that's going to sharply affect my perceptions about what's real. Think of like the debate about vaccines as an example and how like that, 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 that's such an obvious example about how that could go awry. But why I think understanding perceptions is so important is because those have undoubtedly an impact on our behavior. I, I always use this example, and, and Chris, I hope this is what you're thinking, but you know, imagine you wake up in the morning and you turn on the radio and you don't open your window and it says, oh, it's gonna be a hot one out there, right? The, the weather, it's gonna be 40 degrees, humid. You know, you're going to, if you don't look outside and you don't verify that information, if your perception is it is hot outside, you're gonna make choices about what you put on, right? But if you step outside, and it's minus 40. Imagine how you're going to react, right? You're going to be angry. You're going to question the authority of what you listen to, but you're just going to be more, more than anything annoyed. And that is then going to affect the rest of your day. And it's going to affect the way you interact with, with everybody else you see that, that day. And so, um, you know, perceptions will come back, will get closer to reality, but you know, I have been consistently um, not necessarily surprised anymore, but 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 uh, amazed by how often the gap between what people think is happening and what is actually happening um, exists. And then, you know, how you how you have to respond to that, because you're not going to be able to inform the you don't have the ability to form all those consumers. So you have to expect that um, they think certain things are going to happen 
and and therefore that's going to react to their behavior and you need to be there to respond to it yeah to dive into that turbulence so i've got a question here from linkedin and it's marty um, and it goes back to your survey about people having left their jobs so in in your survey did you ask uh, whether or not people who left their jobs actually went and started their own jobs was there a percentage of individuals who who maybe went into an entrepreneurial aspect i didn't ask that but um, I saw, I've seen data. There was, a, I think the Globe and Mail did a great piece with, with, and a number of the publications do this, like the, the most important economic charts of 2021. And one of them showed that uh, entrepreneurship is actually up, that, that um, more people are, are self-employed and, and looking to start and, and have started their own businesses as a result of the pandemic. Um, and because of this need to do my own thing and, and sort of, extract myself from uh, a workplace that I don't get fulfilled from. So I do think it's a great question. I think that that will, um, that will continue to be uh, something people, people do. The other thing to keep in mind about the pandemic that we often underestimate is how, how, how effective it was at, at, at reducing the, what I call the digital gap, right? Oh, yeah. that, that before the pandemic, like I think of my mother who's in her, in her 60s, um, she was already pretty literate on, on a lot of technology, but since the pandemic, she's doing everything online. And so even the ability for my mom to, I don't think she would start a business, but she could probably navigate setting up her own, you know, Shopify store and, and doing knitting and selling it online if she wanted to. And so I think more people have been empowered. They, and it's not just younger generations, I think older generations as well, plus this impetus to kind of have an impact and do your own thing means entrepreneurship, if the ecosystem um, supports it, I think could be a, a thing that comes out in, in real hot uh, way after the pandemic. For sure. And I think, you know, we're getting some comments and, and uh, statements coming in about, you know, again, this this pandemic and, and the supply and demand shortage, this economic tide inflation is really turning up the self-reliance uh, dial um, and uh, capacity in a number of businesses and individuals. And uh, a question is, is, you know, as we get close to the wrap here, because we're going to run out of time, is do you think that self-reliance is better public policy than outsourcing deflation? <laughs> so, you know, should we be encouraging people? You know, what, what should be the messaging either from politics or from business or in, in many of the platforms? Should be, we really be you know, uh, recognizing that tide of self-reliance and encouraging it. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, that's a tough question to answer. I, you know, you, you think that's the case, but, but rarely, um, you know, there are times where we have been able to um, get the public to recognize that, you know, sacrifice was something we needed to do. Obviously, it's happened the last two years. Um, and, and for the very, the most remarkable thing about this pandemic from a, from a social researcher perspective is how quickly people fell into line to do the right thing, to limit their, you know, behaviors and activities because it was in the best interest of themselves and, 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 and their, and their neighbors. On the other hand, um, you know, people, um, they don't want to think about what, what role they have to play and are too often looking um, to whether that be government or other organizations to help them uh, get to what they need. So I'm having a, a tough time answering it, but I, I do think that, that, that we are going to be entering a period. If, if, if this notion of shortage is universal, whether that is government spending, whether that is how much we are able to afford and buy, our expectations for what kind of house we want to live in, um, maybe we do have to start managing our expectations better and also um, focusing a little more on self-reliance. I think you're right. I just think there has to be a, I, I think that's the next phase of this post-pandemic period, because right now it's still about, you know, um, uh, protecting ourselves and getting through this, this last, hopefully last period. 
protectionism. Let's move beyond it. So we're here to uh, close it off uh, in a fabulous hour. Thanks again, David. I want to tell everybody online and uh, that this will be posted to our YouTube channel. So it's the Tech Canada Deeper Insights YouTube channel, as well as it will be uh, up on our, our Tech Canada website very, very soon too. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Your great questions, great stimulation uh, of ideas. And, and once again, uh, David, your, your data and your marketing information is, is so, um, so informative. And we thank you for, for taking this time with us today. My Take pleasure. Care. Thank you.